and stuff like that. So okay, no, we're okay. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you here to the um, meeting of the Minnehaha County Commission. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the Augustana women's softball team who won the NCAA Division II National Championship yesterday. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, we'll go ahead and open with the um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A reminder to silence your cell phones. Uh, meeting documents are available for review down next to Commissioner Heiberger. And Craig is here if you need a listening device this morning. <coughs> that takes us to routine business. I'd consider a motion to approve our agenda. So moved. Second. Second. And a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is um, to approve the commission meeting minutes from May 21st. Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is bills to be paid in the amount of four million two hundred ninety-eight thousand six hundred and thirty-five dollars and twenty cents. Pay the bills. Second. Motion and a second. Any comments? Commissioner Barry. Madam Chair, there are some fairly large bills today, and uh, none of them are the usual <laughs> remittance to the state. Uh, we've got uh, uh, two hundred and two hundred thousand to Armor Correctional Health. We've got. Uh, a total of 363,000 for uh, highway uh, operations. And we've got 2.2 million for uh, our capital projects, which include the jail. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I would just include too with that list of bond redemption. Oh yeah, sorry. almost a million dollars too. So yeah, there's some big stuff in there. So basically, there's nothing else on the. On the <laughs> it is always. Um, very instructive to look through the bills that we paid and see the diversity of um, things that the county is responsible for. So I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, then next takes us to the uh, reports, the Auditor's Office financial reports for April 2019. Vicki Hewitt, good morning. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, Commissioners. Vicki Hewitt from the Auditor's Office here to share the April financial results. Um, we'll start out with the general fund cash balance um, at 19 million, 19 and a half million. So um, actually our maximum balance for the last several years. So um, up 1.5 million from last year. So as you know, April is a typical high month for us. So no surprise there. Um, the highway fund cash balance um, at 11.2. Um, up 2.4 from last year, so um, nothing, no surprises there. Uh, moving on to expenditures, um, <coughs> we are right on track with last year pretty much, um, 19.3 in total expenditures, and of course the um, big chunk of that is personnel at 13.4, and then other expenditures at 5.5 million. And total revenue. Um, total is down just a little bit percentage wise um, over last year. And of course, taxes make up that biggest portion at 18.8 million. Um, probably just down a bit um, due to timing of applying payments or you know when mail is received, that sort of thing. So um, other revenues um, up a little bit, but just not enough to cover those taxes. So, but overall, um, a good April. So. Any questions? Are there any questions for Vicki this morning, Commissioner? Thank you right, very thank much. You. Um, I bring your attention to a couple of other reports there. There's a report from the Minnehaha County Juvenile Detention Center for April and from the Abandoned Cemetery Board um, for April as well. Uh, that takes us to personnel items. I'd consider a motion to approve routine personnel actions. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That takes us to item six, abatements recommended for, uh, for approval. Olivia. Yes. Uh, we have two recommended for approval, both for the Light Mission Pentecostal, uh, parcel 34330, for 2017 property tax in the amount of $125.11, and for 2018 property tax, 
the amount of $1,499.56. Are there any questions for Olivia? I have a question. Um, Commissioner Bart. Apartments? They're, they're, yeah. getting, they're getting an abatement on an apartment? It just seems odd to me. Chris. Yes. Good morning, Chris. Office. Yeah, um, tax exempt is tax exempt. It's re re irrelevant as to what type of property. So, so is it a condo then? <coughs> you know, I, I guess I can't say for certain on this one here, other than they are a tax exempt entity, um, either a 501c3 or a charitable or a benevolent. Um, so, regardless of the property that they own, as long as it's being used for an exempt purpose, then they are granted the exemption. So, um, Madam Chair. So, if right. if it's an apartment, does the land uh, to get the tax break? This would be the whole property. It's not just the apartment or land. It's, it's the entire property. It's the parcel that is owned by them. So an apartment building owned by a tax-exempt entity is exempt? It can be, yes. That's one of the things we would look at down the road as far as their percentage. If it's not totally utilized, then we could do a partially taxable or a partial exemption. Um, they disclose all of that to us. Um, this one here is an abatement from the time that they acquired the property going from taxable to exempt um, so there isn't much to look at there other than ownership and that's why the one amount is $125.11 that's for one month only because they acquired it prior to the 15th so December then the next year is a full year well they have to apply every year we'll dig into that every year and look at how much they're using so um, there is a couple of other things now and I don't know Maggie, Maggie and I will be discussing those further on about those partially taxed and things like that. If there's a part that is used for profit and a part that's used for tax exempt, there's a big case out of Pennington County that got settled about trying to partially tax those and I believe that was a VFW saying, you're competing against the market, you're making profit. They went to court and said, but those profits are then used for our needs and to substitute our charitable or our benevolent cause. Therefore, the entire thing is exempt. So. Um, this is one of the things we look at every year when they make application. They disclose as to what percentage they are or are not taxable. Um, we review those as best as we can. But this one here, ownership is what we're going on now. We're in, we're in an abatement process, so um, there was nothing for, for us to review at the time other than it went from taxable to an exempt entity. It is what it is. So, Thank you. Any other questions? Chris? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call vote, please. Enega? Aye. Heiberger? Aye. Karski? Aye. Barth? No. Bender? Aye. Motion, motion passes four to one. Takes us to item seven, notices and requests. Uh, there's a notice from the South Dakota Health Department of disinternment. Um, takes us to item eight, planning and zoning notices. First item is the first reading and to authorize the auditor to publish notice of public hearing on June 25th. Good morning, Kevin. Yes, good morning, Kevin Hookman, County Planning Department. Uh, yes, this item is a first reading for uh, amendments to the signed regulations of the 1990 revised zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County. Uh, we, the staff has been reviewing this with the Planning Commission since February. Um, uh, from time to time, whenever we meet, we've been releasing a little bit more and, and discussing it as a Planning Commission and the staff. Um, and then as a staff, uh, we've been reviewing it for longer than that. Um, the primary reasons to do the s sign ordinance review uh, is to try to take care of and remove any content-based regulations, so we cannot regulate a sign based on what it says, uh, and then also to revise some of the size requirements uh, to better suit the needs of the, the people in the county and businesses in the county. Uh, just for a quick example, home occupations are only allowed a two square foot sign, which when you're driving by at 55 miles per hour in the houses, uh, 500 feet off the road, that's a pretty small sign. So uh, that sort of changes to the ordinance. Um, the ordinance changes can be found in five different articles of the ordinance, including the Red Rock Corridor Overlay District, additional use regulations, on-premise signs, off-premise signs, and definitions. Um, so this is a first reading, uh, and this is to take action to publish for the notice of hearing 
on June 25th. So is there any questions? Are there any questions for Kevin? I make a motion to uh, publish this, and I do have a comment. <coughs> motion? Second. Motion and a second. Commissioner Barth? I tell you, this issue is uh, like peeling an onion. I mean, when you drive by somebody's house and they have a, a sign on their chain link fence that says, you know, American fence, that's a sign. If you have a, uh, a sign on the, uh, you know, that says wine, that's a sign. I mean, there are just a, an incredible number of signage things. At the same time, regulating them is uh, almost impossible. Mm -hmm. The planning department has been working super hard on this along with the state's attorney's office. And we've reviewed it a couple of times in the planning commission. It's, it's a difficult issue. Any other questions or comments? All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Kevin. Takes us to the next item, which is also Kevin's first reading, and to authorize the auditor to publish notice of public hearing for major amendment number 1902. Yes, uh, Kevin Hookman again, uh, Planning Department. Uh, so this is a major amendment um, to a plan development, and it's to the Perry Plan Development District, which is located uh, along South Dakota Highway 42 and near the, the intersection of Highway 42 and Highway 11. Uh, the, the amendment is for subarea F, and since I do have the PowerPoint up, so there's the whole plan development there. And then the amendment would take place in the sub area F, the little red area on this map. Um, the petitioner for this amendment would like to, to add different commercial uses to the area. The area right now does allow certain commu commercial uses, but it's pretty limited. Uh, and the new uh, listed uses would include retail sales and trade, wholesale personal services, communication facilities and warehousing provided there's no storage of regulated substance and the building contains 10,000 square feet of area or less. Um, so that kind of mirrors or, or is very similar to what is allowed in general commercial zoning districts for that sort of use. Um, the joint city, this is in the joint ju jurisdiction between the city of Sioux Falls and the county and the joint county and city of Sioux Falls planning commission voted to approve this major amendment. Uh, and now this is the first hearing to set a hearing date, which will also be on June 25th. So, is there any questions? Any questions for Kevin? Madam Chair, I would have been yes. <coughs> this is not the same as the article in the newspaper today, by the way, uh, with the Arboretum. However, uh, the applicant uh, previously came into the Planning Commission wanting to build a large accessory building on his property off of Iverson Crossing Road. And uh, there was a large group of people here objecting to it. It was uh, going to be a business on a bad road. And uh, so he modified his plan to try to put it uh, at this other location, which is not in the residential area. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Planning Commission went along with his idea. Sorry, any other comments? Okay, so what I'm looking for is a um, motion to approve an ordinance amending the revised zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County and the City of Sioux Falls by revising Article 14-PD Plan Development District um, and to set a notice of hearing for June 25th, 2019. I'll make that motion, Madam Chair. Second. <coughs> and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Kevin. Next item is the first reading and to authorize the auditor to publish notice of public hearing on June 18, 2019 for an amendment to the 1990 revised zoning ordinance. Good morning, Kevin. Or good morning, Scott. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Scott Anderson, Planning Director. So today I'm asking that you would uh, set a hearing date of June 18 for a rezoning request. This is to rezone five acres located about four miles southwest of Baltic from an ag district to the Almond Branch Plan Development District. Uh, the the uh, Planning Commission has reviewed this at their uh, May 20th meeting last week ago Monday 
They recommended denial. Uh, it is for a, a wedding, an events facility like Wedding Barn and one single family residence. Um, the, I included the map, the PowerPoint, and the minutes for your review. Um, I'm requesting that you authorize the auditor to publish a hearing notice, uh, a hearing which would be held uh, June 18th, uh, 2019 at 9 a.m. in this room, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, I see that our IT person's left the room, so I won't be able to show you the map at this point, but. Are there questions? Um, Just go ahead. Commissioner Karski. I just was going to clarify that this was uh, Minneapolis County Rezoning Project Number 19-05 because nobody has said that. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Move to set the date of hearing for June 18th. Second. I think I need to clarify that motion. I apologize. Would we'd like to set the date of hearing for an ordinance amending the 1990 revised zoning ordinance for Minnehaha County by rezoning certain property. Rezoning 19-05. Correct. Is that your motion? No. That is my motion. And a second. So we have a motion and a second. Any further comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next item is petition for compromise of lien. There is none. Uh, this is now our opportunity for public comment. If there's anyone here who would like to speak about something that's not otherwise on our agenda, this is your chance. I don't see anybody rushing for the podium. Okay, so that takes us to regular business. Our um, first item is to authorize the chairperson to sign an agreement with Short Elliott Hendrickson for administration of Project MC 18-09. DJ Boothy, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. Uh, the County Commission recently authorized a construction contract with Pram Construction to reconstruct structure 50-231-130. It is over Slip Up Creek, just a mile north of County Highway 130, and a uh, mile east of County Highway 125. Uh, we had uh, Short Elliott Hendrickson or SCH design this construction or design this project and today we're hoping to enter into an agreement for them to conduct construction administration services uh, in the amount of $61,363. Uh, we're looking at half-time inspection for this and it's it's more than likely going to be a 60-day construction period and should be done uh, by November of this fall. If you have any questions, I can stand by. Any questions for DJ? If not, I'd entertain a motion. Move to approve. Se second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right, the next item is a brief presentation from the Compass Center Family Violence Project. Michelle Trent, good morning, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I know you're used to seeing our previous executive director, Michelle Mark Graff, and I am standing in in her absence as we're looking for a new um, executive director. But I'm here to give you a kind of a briefing about some potential changes that may occur for the Family Violence Project, which you all fund. So right now, the Family Violence Project is housed in, at the Compass Center, and you all provide funding for that, which is um, very well used and, and very well needed. So this program works specifically with offenders of domestic violence, so they're often court ordered or may choose to come in independently to receive treatment for their power and control issues that cause them to use domestic violence or violence in their relationship. And um, there's a variety of reasons that the Compass Center is kind of examining the options for moving this program perhaps to another um, entity. And LSS is here as representatives of that about a potential um, change to that program. One of the reasons um, that in your briefing memo, memo that I um, drafted for you, um, one of the things that we've noticed in this program is that folks um, that come into us often have a variety of needs, not just offending behavior. They also maybe um, are out unemployed or maybe they're re-entering um, from jail or prison or maybe they have other um, needs in the community and we don't have the resources to be able to provide those. So that's one of the reasons that we have identified that folks would be more successful or perhaps more successful if they had access to those other resources. Um, the other pieces here, um, the main concern for us is our federal funding prevents us from cross-training. So federally, um, we are funded by the Violence Against Women Act, who, which says that no person that provides services to victims can have information about offender. 
treatment that is also housed in the same area. And so this means that we have one staff member who is in charge of this program and what keeps us up at night is if something were to happen to that one staff member, we don't have the ability to cross train anybody else because all of the rest of our folks that are employed at the Compass Center provide victim services. And so they can't also have uh, people who have offender services or offender treatment can't also have victim related information and then finally a reason of looking at this is um, for our survivors that come in to see us um, sometimes it is difficult to keep their offender who is also coming to the same place away from the survivor who is in that facility and so we are looking at the possibility of a change um, from the Compass Center to LSS. Nothing has been decided at this point. We are not committed to that, and LSS um, hasn't committed either. But we wanted to talk with you as a part of our kind of due diligence in this process of figuring out what that transition looked like, because we do feel that this is a very important um, service for our county and that we provide very good services and we want to make sure that the funding that you all provide would be able to transfer to LSS if we were to move that program. So that's the, our kind of point of just briefing you on what's happening and then certainly would entertain any questions about that possible change um, and then um, as you're starting your budget discussions to keeping, keeping those pieces in mind. Thank you. Are there any questions for Michelle? Commissioner Benega. Uh, Michelle, is there any time frame that's been established on when that conversation will be completed or are decisions made? We are probably looking um, in 2020. Okay. Um, we It would be challenging to make a transition in 2019 yet, although there would be perhaps some possibility for that. Um, we also, like I said, we're in the middle of a transition at the Compass Center with a new executive director coming in in about two weeks, and so that would give that person some time to get in um, and be a part of that discussion as well. Um, so probably 2020, but perhaps sooner. And the program's mission and goals and objectives are all going to stay the same as originally planned, if you will? Yeah, the program is going to aim to work with domestic violence offenders. Um, LSS is already doing some work with um, domestic violence offenders, and certainly I, I don't want to speak for them in the work that they're doing, but if you have questions about that, I'm sure that they would be happy to provide that. So they're already doing some work with domestic violence offenders. I think that this would be um, a good complement to the things that they're already doing, plus they're resources and, and ability to provide other services I think is a really huge piece of what this program is missing. So I think it would only expand on the th um, treatment for the folks that are coming in to see us. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I appreciate you providing this information. I, we are, are going to be moving into our budget cycle for 2020, and so um, perhaps as your talks progress, if, you know, if you could um, think through some um, wording or something that might be helpful to you guys as you're moving forward so that as we do our budgeting we could be specific that any funding we want for this program goes with the program and not to the entity that would be helpful to us okay yeah we Does can that make sense yeah we can certainly look at that okay okay Commissioner Heiberg just gonna ask if Alice has, has any comments since you did come if you have anything you want to say okay all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh, good morning, Michelle. You came. Thank you. It's good to see you. Do you have any comments? Michelle Markgraf, Sioux Falls. Um, I am coming just to say that this is not something that the Compass Center is doing just because I left. <laughs> uh, this is something that I have worked on up to this point, and I believe it is something good for the community, both for our survivors and the batterers that we work with. Thank you for coming. Yep. I appreciate it. Okay, that takes us to item 12, which is a brief presentation on the Minnehaha County 4-H Spring Program. Chuck, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Chuck Martinell, SDSU Extension Minnehaha County 4-H Department, Extension Department. Just going to go over a brief presentation here about our uh, Minnehaha County 4-H Program, what we've, what we've been up to for the last uh, few months since we last spoke. Um, so just to remind you guys what the... Uh, mission of 4-H is mission of 4-H is to empower youth to reach their full potential working in uh, learning and par partnerships with uh, caring adults excuse me I have a bit of a frog um, and that's one of the things here with 4-H this program we work with a lot of adults we have a lot of adult volunteers uh, our, our volunteers number in the hundreds 
um, which without them, this program would not be uh, an option um, just because there's uh, so little full-time staff. So um, once again, that, but that's the way Forge has always been operated. That's not nothing new. And um, we rely heavily on uh, adult men mentoring. This past spring here, our 2018-19 recap, I uh, last spoke to you guys last fall in November. I guess that's when we're towards winter time um, in South Dakota. Uh, we were just wrapping up a lot of our fall programming, going into our winter programming, planning season for our spring programming. Uh, pretty pleased to announce our, our spring program was, was very successful. Uh, our busiest time of the year is actually, um, a lot of people think August with fair is a very busy time. And that is correct. We have a lot of events going on at that time um, with the fair, with ki getting our kids ready to go to state fair. Um, that is true with horse shows. All summer we are busy, but the spring is actually where we hit the most youth because we are doing our most of our biggest programs then. Um, some of the programs we're involved with is the water festival, um, egg days at the pavilion, uh, women in science, all three of those programs. We are in the planning committee of that, which we help recruit, organize, plan, help plan the educational curriculum that's going to be taught at those programs and we work those events um, also. So of those three events we have about 6,000 youth come to them um, which is a substantial number of kids. Also during this time um, Nathan continued to do his polymer curriculum um, into the after school programs. Um, he hit about another uh, three to five hundred kids with that curriculum during that time frame. And then I also did what I call Chicks in the Classroom, where we hatched chicks, uh, and I hit about 1,000 students within 29 classrooms. And we hatched about 350 chicks, who all went to 4-H families who are now raising potentially 4-H projects. So um, it's kind of a nice, long um, pro project for those kids. The uh, one of the big things we're getting from after school programs is we want they want more of us coming out there doing those things uh, even in school programs want us to come out more um, next fall I'll be implementing butterflies in the classroom where I'll be doing a similar thing with with different classrooms in raising uh, actually hatching butterflies in those classrooms so um, we are being requested quite a bit to get out there and, and do more programming so um, we had to be somewhat selective and choosy occasionally, but it's, it's okay. It's a good problem. Um, as touched on the in-school programming here, uh, Chicks in the Classroom, like I said, it's, it's a huge program. I'm doing it for five years. Um, youth have, have learned uh, valuable lessons. It all began from one preschool classroom five years ago to, like I said, now it's 29 uh, different classrooms we're into. Also, we're doing character all-stars at the same time. Character All-Stars is our character leadership program in which we have youth, um, uh, once again, doing different leadership uh, programs. Um, basically, we want teachers to nominate those youth that they think that are highly, uh, have high character, have high qualities that represent 4-H, and not just in sports, but in other academics. And we want to look at um, how do we foster those and how do we grow that in other kids. Moving into our summer fall programming, once again, our after school programs are kind of wrapped up, but we still do programs with them in the summer. We'll be with the YMCA, uh, most likely. JDC will be doing their gardening program if the weather ever straightens up and the soil temperatures ever get above 50 degrees. <laughs> uh, it's hard, tough to grow, <laughs> grow anything in the ground when it's cold. Uh, Boys and Girls Club will be at LSS. Uh, Nathan is working with uh, LSS and CARE program about setting up some programming for this summer. Our large events in the summer, of course, we have the fair. Um, we'll do the Sidewalks Arts Festival as a participant. Uh, we'll do Youth Family Days, Colton Days, Fall Harvest Festival. All those are, are basically participating in providing programming, uh, drop-in programming. So uh, we're not planning those, but we do offer programming at those events. So, And I'll entertain any questions you guys might have. Questions? Commissioner Heiberger. I actually have two. Um, and your large events that you're doing, so do those communities contact you and say, um, hey, you know, we're interested in you coming and setting up a booth? Is yep. that how that word gets out? Yeah, but a lot of times it's through our volunteers who are on those planning committees. So they'll contact us and or the 4-H club up in that area will ask us to come up and do something. Like Colton Days, I've done judging of the 
pet parade to um, airplanes to just about anything that's kind of just a nice quick drop in five minute activity so my other question was I was wondering what Nathan's polymer um, program entails I, I know what polymers are just because my brother was an analytic chemist for a huge for DuPont and did all the analysis of the polymers. So I'm just curious what we're doing with polymers. And well, Nathan's doing polymers. It's a, it's a pilot program for 4-H curriculum, so he's testing it out. And um, uh, basically, he's looking at the different plastics and how they break down through different uses and how we have different types of plastics, what's recyclable, what's not recyclable. So I'll definitely have to have him touch base more on that. But you should have him touch base with me because I might yeah. have some really good insight for you. I was going to say, that I, we, we kind of separated those out, so I, that, that's his baby, and yeah. I know the, the basics, but. Okay, thanks. I remember him talking about it briefly because I remember thinking I should enroll. <laughs> I think I'd have a lot I could learn, so. <laughs> Any other questions this morning? Commissioner Barth. Um, in the past, we used to get uh, water festival programs down here where we'd have 10 kids uh, show us their posters and uh, uh, did we discontinue that or well for the water festival yeah um, a little bit just because they don't do posters anymore there okay they've moved on to quiz bowls and more hands-on learning activities that that aren't just posters so I'll, no I'll problem I just thought I asked where it went and uh, yeah it's kind of went the way of the, the, the dodo Yes, also I would comment, I think you have too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of fun. Keep this going. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you very much for coming this morning and providing us this information. Thank you very much. Okay, that takes us to item 13, where we'll consider a motion to authorize the state's attorney to sign two agreements for Indian Child Welfare Act Qualified Expert Witness Services. Drew DeGroat, good morning. Hi, Drew DeGroat from the state's attorney's office. Uh, as stated in the memorandum, uh, the state's attorney is seeking authorization to sign two contracts, the first from the state that provides the county funding for the qualified expert witness and uh, to the, the contract with the expert witness. Um, this is a net neutral uh, expense for the county. Um, we receive the funding from the state and then disperse it to the expert witness. Are there any questions for Drew? We're going to need to do this in two different motions. I would make a motion to approve the uh, witness services contract, or the, I'm sorry, the Indian Child Care Qualified Expert Witnesses Services. Okay, so I think if you don't mind, the first motion I'd like is that um, to approve uh, the agreement between Minnehaha County State's Attorney and the State Department of Social Services to provide funds to acquire the Indian Child Welfare Act Expert Witnesses That's Services. Gerald's That's Gerald's motion. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> So I have a motion. Second. A motion and a second. Any further questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. The next one would be a motion to approve the contract between Minnehaha County State's Attorney and Luke Yellow Robe of Yellow Robe Consulting to provide professional services as an ICWA expert witness. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Any further comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Drew. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to item 14, which are liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports this morning, Commissioner Heiberger? No, it wouldn't be normal if I didn't have a liaison <laughs> report. So if I, I dug to find one for today. Um, this past week, we had the uh, MacArthur Foundation um, Safety and Justice Challenge team meeting. Um, and some of the things that we discussed were, well, one, um, our research associate analysis, our per personnel was hired um, jointly between the, the grant position and USD um, Med School. And um, he started, and so he came and was introduced, and he will be working on collecting all the data and putting the data forth that will go back to the MacArthur Foundation, but also be used by the different departments. Um, everybody needs a, d a data analysis in, in these days. So um, we met him this last week. They also discussed some of the other grant-funded positions that will be coming, and one of them that we discussed was a community resource, op resource officer that will pu be put into the Sioux Falls PD with the hopes that when the grant's put um, gone that the Sioux Falls, that Sioux Falls will continue to um, fund this position in their department. And they will be working collaboratively with the sh <coughs> sheriff's office 
um, to share some of the services or at least share some of the training that's going on with that person. And we discuss a couple other ones that aren't, um, that we don't have. Um, the paperwork, maybe that's what I want to say it for, the one would be a behavioral health caseworker under the Alliance program. Um, the other one is a peer navigator, but we'll be discussing that next week. That peer navigator would probably be with a nonprofit group in, the, in Sioux Falls. And, um, and we just did some updates on the triage program and the case processing that's going on in the court system. So the judges from um, UJS came over and gave a report on, on um, different ways for court reminders that they'll be instituting pretty soon, which is the text messaging and phone calls, and also how they're changing um, the case processing. They did a stress test by grabbing a whole bunch of um, different cases, and a group got together and discussed how those cases go through the court system and what they can do to improve the flow. And so we got updates on those types of things. So it was a good meeting. Thank you. Any other liaison reports this morning? Okay, so that takes us to item 15, new business. Madam Chair. Commissioner Barth. Quick comment. I, I know we're about to go into some deep work on uh, our budget for 2020, and I really hope our citizens pay attention because it's going to be a tough year, and it's important that, uh, that your questions be asked, uh, answered uh, as we go through the process. And, you know, don't come back after it's all been approved and ask questions. Keep an eye on, on it as we go and come bring in your questions. Thank you. I think Carol was going to give a brief update on the budget process. Oh, I think so. I thought we were going to do it under new business. It was a nice segue that Jeff gave you, however. <laughs> I had to cover for him. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Commission Office. Yes, next week you start budget process and uh, just want to review a little bit and for the public who may be listening what, what dates and what times that you have. Uh, underneath state law, you've got a couple dates that you need to meet. By the end of July, you need to have a provisional budget passed and the end of September is the final budget and July 15th is the date if you are going to be doing an opt-out and what you have to be noticed. So that kicks everything into early June, basically, to go through and get those done. So you will start next Tuesday, June 4th at 1 p.m. The schedule, the agenda will be very similar to what we've done in the past. We will be bringing in the sheriff's and the state's attorney's office for their um, staffing requests at that particular time. Your next meeting then will be June 6th, which is on that Thursday, and that will be in the morning from eight to nine. There's an additional six agencies, six departments and offices that have asked for um, staffing, and you will hear those at that particular time. And as we start updating, and hopefully you'll be able to do some deliberation and discussion at that point also. We skip the next week and we jump down to June 19th, which is a morning meeting, um, and we'll continue a discussion that we need to do, because I doubt very much you're gonna get done next week. So uh, we'll be going to that. We do have an extra date set aside. On the off chance, we need to have it, which is July 8th in the morning, which is a Monday. And that's a hold date, only if we need to have it because we're still having budget discussions because July 9th is the date, last date you'll be meeting before a potential opt-out. So everything's on Dropbox for you. And uh, you, I know you spend every night peeling over lots of narratives and spreadsheets and reports that we have. Any questions for Carol? I was looking at it at midnight last night, just so you know. I was too. It's a lot but of good information, and we appreciate <laughs> a lot of hard work goes into budgeting every year um, from every every area that we have budgeting authority for. So we do appreciate the folks that spend a lot of time preparing reports for us, and we have a lot of hard decisions to make, mm -hmm. as we normally do when it comes to budgeting, but this year uh, might be particularly challenging for a couple of different reasons. So I would echo Commissioner Barr's comments that um, this is a is a important time sets so really in a lot of ways our course for the entire next year and so would encourage citizen involvement as much as possible any other new business okay any old business I'm just going to bring up, because um, I think it's a great segue, I'm looking at Commissioner Benninger uh, because I thought maybe he might say something. Last week we had a presentation from the Treasurer's Office about unpaid property taxes, and as we're going into budget season and money is tight, and you look at the fact that darn near a million dollars has not been collected, 
in back property taxes, and this has been going on for several years, and I realize that there's a state statute that says we don't have to collect them until X number of years out, but I'm just wondering what the protocol is going, f you know, when somebody doesn't pay them, do they get a notice? Do they get a notice every year? Do they get a notice after four or five years? I mean, what is it? Because not having a million dollars paid in property taxes affects all of us who are paying our property taxes because we will probably be looking at an opt-out this year and Carol told us what that deadline is and I doubt that million dollars is going to be collected between now and when we have to make that decision about property tax opt-out. So I think it's just another question to talk about um, and obviously the Treasurer isn't available today. It's just something I thought needed to be brought up again since we're talking about that money is always tight and then you find out that we have all these people that have not paid their property taxes and I'm just wondering where we are um, with the treasurer's office as notifying these people that you have back taxes and you so um, something that needs to be brought up again so Mr. Benninger well I was going to bring it up under old business since we reviewed it last week but I agree with Commissioner Heiberger is that I think not only is it more than a million dollars I think we sh saw a schedule that showed a million too but I think we need to know more about the process the timing the implications uh, the implementation and all those kinds of things to make sure that uh, what we're doing is effective and if it's not we need to review that okay thank you we can certainly um, relay those comments to the treasurer's office and see if we can get a further clarification on deadlines and, and process any other comments? Any other old business? Okay, we do have an executive session today, so I would entertain a motion to recess the Minnehaha County Commission meeting. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, we will plan to reconvene in about 10 minutes. Okay.